Hello, wise guys. Have you ever found yourself pondering the enigmatic smile of noodles at the end of Once Upon a Time in America? Well, buckle up, because we're about to dive deep into the labyrinth of Sergio Leone's masterpiece. What really happens at the conclusion of this cinematic saga? How did the producers mess with the director's vision, leaving audiences scratching their heads? I've sifted through the director's cut, poured over insightful interviews, and delved into the depths of the accompanying novel to bring you the answers you've been craving. Originally conceived as a monumental two-part saga, Once Upon a Time in America underwent a tumultuous journey at the hands of distributors. The resulting American release, truncated and controversial, fell short of capturing the greatness of Leon's vision. Yet, amidst the commercial disappointment, the original European cut emerged as a beacon of cinematic brilliance, revered by cinephiles for its epic scope and profound exploration of the gangster genre. As we delve into the pivotal moments of Noodles and his cohorts, it's imperative to recognize the roots from which this tale springs. Inspired by Harry Gray's autobiographical novel The Hoods, Leone's cinematic odyssey draws deeply from the well of Gray's own experiences. Thus, in our exploration, we shall not only traverse the movie, but also peer into the pages of Gray's memoir, unraveling the mysteries that lie therein. So, let's start with the pivotal moment when everything goes wrong. That is, when Noodles calls the cops and sets his friends up. Noodles hopes that this way he can keep his friends from certain death. Max knocks Noodles out, so the trio is forced to go on the case without De Niro's character. The gangsters end up resisting arrest, and the police murder Max and the team in an unequal fight. Noodles comes to his senses, realizes he has made an irreparable mistake, and rushes to the aid of Moe and his girlfriend. That's how things were in the movie. Now let's find out how it was in the book. In the novel, Noodles, Max, Cockeye, and Patsy are asked to convoy a large shipment of illegal booze belonging to the organization, after which Max and his friends plan to raid a cherished reserve bank. Noodles, wanting to avoid death for himself and his friends, informs the cops of the impending conveyance. I got a good tip for you. Right at that moment, Noodles' mother dies, he sends her away for the last time, and dives into a wave of oblivious drunkenness. The day before, Max suggests that his friends collect their savings and deposit them in a bank vault under other people's names. What for, you may ask? As we recall, Capone was caught in tax evasion, and Max's gang wanted to avoid a similar fate. Each of the four was assigned a personal box with a cipher. Before he went to escort the shipment of booze, Max deposited the money, and upon successful completion of the operation, he was to give the information and keys to each of his friends. Like in the film, the three friends resist during a police raid and end up dead. Noodles only learns of the tragic news the next day, having come out of a drunken haze. The members of the organization begin to hunt for him. He narrowly escapes, after which he hides out in an opium smokehouse in Chinatown. The book's finale is rather closed. We don't need to speculate, especially since the book has a sequel, Call Me Duke, where Noodles recounts his adventures after the events of the first book. Meaning, in the book, Noodles is not smiling in an opium-fueled haze, as if to tell us, the audience. Well, guys, what do you think happened? No, I don't want to say that this is a bad thing. On the contrary, such an ending is good for the movie. For which a big kudos to Sergio Leone. It should be said that Leone was not the one who invented the opium story. In the book, the opium trips of the main characters are repeated in probably every third chapter. In those days, opium was extremely popular among the American people, so Noodles and his friends got familiar with the substance when they graduated from the seventh grade. No, the gang wasn't consuming at the time, they were acting as delivery men for one middle-class gangster. I assume the friends started using O during the period when Noodles was in the can. Max was tightly connected to the O, as he had been selling the product for some time and could perfectly distinguish a good stuff from a phony one. It wasn't anything unusual for the quartet, and they occasionally stopped in smokeries to relax a bit. For example, in the book before one of the important meetings with the head of the organization, the four hang out in an opium den. And in this episode, the book describes in great detail one of Noodles' dope trips. An entire chapter consists of detailed descriptions of the images that De Niro's character has seen in his dreams. In short, Noodles sees himself and his friends as the heroes of some fairy tale, they are the knights, and the head of the organization is the king. And the vision seems so realistic to Noodles that he forgets about reality and travels with his friends in an opium dream. Let's abstract for a second and figure out what the organization, or as the gangsters themselves called it in the film, The Syndicate, is. 
The National Crime Syndicate was a multi-ethnic, closely connected American confederation of several criminal organizations. It mostly consisted of and was led by the closely interconnected Italian-American mafia and Jewish mob. I hope it's clear now, so let's keep talking about our favorite movie. Now I'm going to quote one interview with Leone, where he talks extensively about the properties of opium, which will help us a lot in understanding how the movie actually ended. The special thing about opium is that the drug makes you imagine the future as the past. Opium creates a vision of the future. Other drugs only make you see the past. So while Noodles dreams of what his life could be, and while he imagines his future, it gives me, as a European filmmaker, the opportunity to dream within the American myth. And there it is, the perfect combination. We walk together, Noodles with his dream, and I with mine. Because as far as I'm concerned, Noodles never leaves 1930. He dreams everything. The whole movie is Noodles' opium dream. To further support the director's word, let's recall the scene where Noodles rescues a half-dead Mo by distracting the bandits with an elevator. If most of the movie looks realistic, this scene is more like an action movie with a lone vigilante who is more than capable of taking out the bad guys. I think it looks like a dream, because in the movie the four were opportunistic thugs, and here Noodles turns into a real hero. I also find the scene where Deborah and Noodles meet in the theater very strange. I think that after what Noodles did to her, she wouldn't let him get within a mile of her. That was the point of no return. But what do we see in this scene? Deborah doesn't hold a grudge against Noodles. You might say she even sees an old friend. If this doesn't even seem strange to you, pay attention to her look. Noodles, after all these years, has turned into an old man who now needs glasses. He is decrepit, slow. Time has taken its toll. But look at Deborah. You might say she hasn't changed at all since the last time they met. And of course, she wishes Noodles well, warning him in advance not to fall for the trick of the cunning Senator Bailey. In reality, I think she would gladly feed Noodles to the sharks for what he did to her. And to nicely sum up the scene in the theater, the highlight of the show. Walking out the front door, Noodles meets a teenager who looks just like Max. What's more, he turns out to be Deborah's son from her affair with Senator Bailey. Where do you see that? If not in a dream, let's move on. Despite Deborah's persuasion, Noodles sets out to meet the senator. At the senator's estate, Noodles sneaks into the main room and comes face to face with Senator Bailey, who has disturbed Noodles' peace of mind. De Niro's character reveals a terrible truth. Senator Bailey, it's Max. It turns out that he faked his death, pocketed the gang's money, and purchased himself a new name and status through his ties to the labor unions and the mafia. And for what purpose does Max call Noodles after all these years? To make Noodles take his life. And Noodles, being a true gentleman, forgives Max and spares the traitor by refusing to take his life. Doesn't this sound like Noodles' dreams to you? Max turns out to be the villain who takes Noodles beloved in cash, and then, tortured by no idea what, asks Noodles to take his life. Noodles, as if a highly moral person, having gone through all the misery, is able to forgive all. Once again, Noodles dreams of his ideal future where he is a true knight and everyone around him traitors. Now let's recall the final scene of the movie. Noodles moves away from Max's estate, then turns around and sees a garbage truck approaching. The car's headlights are blinking. A couple of seconds later, we see Max approaching the truck and then disappearing behind it. The next moment, we are shown the garbage being processed by the grinders, but we don't see Max's body, not even a trace of blood. The strange thing is, we don't even hear any screams. The truck disappears into the darkness, and from where it disappeared, a column of cars appears with people celebrating something. Alcohol in their hands and music blaring from the cars. Pay attention to how the cars themselves look. They look like models from the 30s. And the people themselves are probably celebrating repeal of prohibition. In other words, Noodle sees things from his era. Considering that it is the late 70s, early 80s, I assume that by that time the car industry had made a big step forward and the cars must have looked something like this. Now, to finally dispel all doubts, let's look at the restored scene in which De Niro's aging character comes to visit the graves of his fallen friends. All three are buried in the same building. The cemetery supervisor calls this facility the shelter. We'll come back to that title very soon, but for now, let's look at another scene. It is about a scene in Florida. Max and Noodles are relaxing on the beach with their girlfriends. Prohibition is over, which means they need to find a new business for themselves. Suddenly, Max reveals his plan to raid the Federal Reserve Bank. 
which would make all four of them incredibly rich. I swear to God, Noodles, you and me together, we can make it come true. The events in the book and the movie are very different. While in the movie, Max becomes obsessed with the idea over time, in the book, the idea to rob the Federal Reserve was born to him in the seventh grade and never let him rest until his death. Of course, Noodles thinks as soberly as possible. He realizes that a raid on the Federal Reserve is a suicide mission, something he told Max more than once, but Max didn't care because by then he had developed severe megalomania and was confident of the success of his plan. You're really crazy. To evaluate the situation, Noodles takes a job for a day as a courier on a truck delivering food to various government organizations, including the Reserve. Upon arriving at the site, Noodles is even more convinced that if they go to work, they are all screwed. There is not a single chance of success. The building is guarded by dozens of guards with machine guns. But let's get back to the scene in Florida. Mad Max draws the Federal Reserve Bank in the sand. And the drawing, as we have already guessed, resembles the shelter. I think the drawing represents Max taking himself and his friends to the grave, and Noodles understood this better than anyone else. In reality, Max died with his comrades during the ambush. Max's growing ambition wouldn't have led the gang to good things one way or another, and the once good friendship ended badly for everyone. Though the movie may not show this clearly, the book puts serious emphasis on this detail. Max wasn't always mad. From the start, he was a wise leader who led the four to victory, and that was until Max got involved with a blonde psycho, the one that tried to guess the identity of the foursome from their joysticks in the movie, as Noodles put it. She squeezed all the juice out of Max. Max became edgy, tired, even mad. Like in the movie, in the book, Max even acquired himself a throne, on which he sat majestically at the headquarters of the gang. I suppose everyone is wondering about what the enigmatic smile of Noodles breaking through the fourth wall really means. After seeing the opium dream, where Max becomes the wily Senator Bailey in the style of a tough action movie, Noodles grins, for he realizes that he has made the right choice or he is in shock from what he has seen and still doesn't fully understand where the dream is and where reality is, because the stupefaction has erased the boundaries of his mind. It must be said that in the book, Noodles often smiles in a similar manner after each opium trip. His friends notice this and say that Noodles has gone mad, all the time chuckling silently. Based on the words of director Sergio Leone and the facts we learned in this video, I dare to say that all the events we see after the death of Noodles' friends are just Noodle's opium dreams. I think that Noodles felt remorse, and in a way, the dream calmed him down because he thought he had made the right choice. Well, let's hope that in the movie, the fate of De Niro's character is no less positive than in the novel. So what do you think? What does Noodles' smile really mean? Was it a dream? Let me know in the comments down below. If you're as intrigued as we are by the blurred lines between fiction and reality in the mob world, then you won't want to miss our full video on the Sopranos actors turned criminals in real life. Hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and drop your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time, stay wise and don't forget to hit that notification bell. Thanks for watching.